Thanks, everyone, for coming. This is the Kubernetes uh, multi-tenancy working group deep dive. And um, I'm uh, David Oppenheimer. I'm a software engineer at Google. And unfortunately, uh, my co-lead of the working group, uh, Jess Frizzell, was not able to come to KubeCon. Um, otherwise, uh, she'd be here um, co-leading this session with me. Um, so we kind of have two parts of the session planned. One is a few folks uh, had presentations that they wanted to do, a few uh, slides about ideas they've been thinking around, about around multi-tenancy and policies and things in that area. And then also we um, had some, collected some, uh, some, some brainstorming ideas in a doc um, that people were interested in just having free-form discussion about, but we don't have to stick to what's there. Uh, we can also uh, talk about whatever folks in the audience are uh, interested in talking about. One of the things that um, went pretty well, the last KubeCon, we did a multi-tenancy working group deep dive. That was actually the first um, uh, uh, deep dive session we had for the working group, um, was people talked about how they're using multi-tenancy in Kubernetes today and like what kinds of features are missing from the system or are difficult to use that they'd like to see. Um, and so that's something that we could do if, if people uh, are interested in talking about their use cases because uh, we obviously want to the the feature set in Kubernetes to be driven by the things people actually need, not just something that's you know created in some kind of ivory tower. So um, maybe we can do that when we when we get to the discussion section. So um, the first of the four, I think it's four presentations, uh, is um, something that I'll be presenting. Um, so it's uh, uh, an idea we've been uh, developing at Google and proposed in uh, the multi-tenancy working group and SIGOF and the policy working group called uh, Kubernetes Security Profile. And actually the work uh, was done by uh, my colleague, Yi Sui Hu, um, who's uh, another uh, engineer at Google in um, the Kubernetes and container engine team. Unfortunately, he was not able to attend, so I'm going to be presenting this uh, in, his, in his place. So. <clears throat> The idea of security profile um, is to improve the usability of Kubernetes security and multi-tenancy features. So um, the observation we made was that today, in order to operate a secure or multi-tenant cluster, a cluster administrator has to have a pretty deep understanding both of security in general and also about the specific uh, security policies that Kubernetes lets you express. Uh, and so this can be pretty complicated, uh, and, and especially for, for people who are new to the system or who just don't want to understand things that deeply but do want a secure system. And then even if you do develop that kind of uh, understanding of uh, the policies and figure out what is appropriate for your environment, um, the actual process of writing down those policies in the in the YAMLs, you know, in the in the format that Kubernetes requires is error prone. And if you want to do that reproducibly, you need tooling. And then uh, lastly, even if you're able to figure out the right policies and write them down and develop tools for applying them, say in new clusters that you bring up or in new namespaces that you create, um, the policy configurations need to be updated as new Kubernetes features are added uh, over time. And so there's kind of a, a versioning a challenge that, that you have as an administrator. And so the idea of a security profile is to create a small menu of versioned, community-curated policy profiles to enable turnkey cluster creation with the desired security and tenant isolation. Um, so that's kind of a lot of words, but um, kind of conveys what the idea is that we're, that we're getting at. And by everywhere, we mean like these should run the same way, whether you're running on um, any of the cloud providers or on-prem using a tool like Kubeatom uh, and so on. And so the idea would be that you would run a command like kubeatom init and then pass in the name of one of these security profiles. There might be kind of a secure by default security profile um, or one that's say uh, intended for uh, SaaS um, where you have you know, strong isolation between namespaces because you're running uh, say instances of a, of a single tenant application, multiple replicas of that one for each of the users of the system um, and so on. And, and then also um, this would work across upgrades both of the cluster and and of the security profiles themselves. And so you can see there's kind of two pieces to the names of these profiles. There's um, the, the, the name that describes the use case, like SAS, uh, multi-tenancy, or default, and then also a version associated with it. And since this is only supposed to be like a five-minute talk, I can't go into all the details of the versioning and, and, and that, but um, there are uh, proposals uh, that are out uh, for review by the community that go into more detail. Um, and so the idea behind the security profile, what's going on under the covers, is that it kind of wraps 
three places where policies get specified today. So one is uh, what we call bootstrapping rules. Um, so these are, uh, for example, command line flags. So if you want a secure cluster, you have to have the right flags passed to the API server, um, the kubelet, and so on. And so um, today, you read these in some blog posts on the internet, or uh, occasionally there'll be documentation saying what the right choices are. The idea here is to, you know, kind of encode these in in kind of curated and and well accepted uh, uh, profiles. So, bootstrapping rules is the first one. Uh, cluster scope policy objects like pod security policy, and then the third is uh, namespace scope policy objects like network policy. And then we um, don't dictate. How these, how the security profile gets unwrapped, and how these policies that it embeds uh, get applied to the system. But the idea would be that um, there would be a variety of what we were calling enforcers uh, that uh, could would apply them to the system, and it depends on what kind of policy you're uh, talking about. So, uh, for example, I showed that you know the command line flags would be applied by say kubeatom when you bring up the cluster. Um, the cluster scope policy objects could be. Uh, injected into the system by the add-on manager or just through um, invoking cube control apply. And then the namespace scope policy objects, the idea being that you could automatically populate new namespaces with particular policy objects when they get created. That could be done um, through uh, something like admission control. And then the uh, little Kubernetes conformance test box that's off to the side is just to um, mention that we want these profiles to be integrated into Kubernetes conformance so that uh, when you bring up a cluster using one of these named uh, uh, profiles, uh, it behaves the same everywhere, no matter uh, where you're running the uh, security profile. And uh, so we have a demo that may or may not work. Um, let's see. Uh, yes, so I showed this the other day and found that uh, going to 1.25 speed is uh, slightly better. And so anyway, the um, demo is going to show, unfortunately, the text at the top left, which is kind of the most important, was covered up. But uh, <laughs> it was uh, doing that kubeatom command that, uh, that I, that I uh, illustrated uh, before, where you're passing in the name of the security profile. And here it's bringing up uh, the cluster. Uh, and we're going to add a node to the cluster and install Calico. The reason we're installing Calico is so we can use network policy. And the reason we're using network policy is so we can give an example of a policy that gets automatically populated into the namespace uh, when you create a namespace. So we will see that part in a second. But uh, here we're uh, installing um, uh, Calico. And maybe I should do this at 1.5 speed. Uh, so yeah, then in the, on the right side, uh, we're going to do a watch to wait for the nodes to become ready. I think I will actually go to 1.5 speed. Um, and right, and so the security profiles are represented as uh, CRD. Um, so that, that kind of thing, that box that was at the top of the chart that was the security profile itself that wraps the other policies uh, is represented as a custom resource. Uh, you can see here that we installed three of these uh, custom resources, uh, 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 three you know objects of that custom resource type. Um, and then separately, we can select which one should be enabled in the cluster. Uh, I think that's the command that's going to uh, be next, or maybe that was already run. Um, but anyway, the idea is that there's a, a separate object called a selector that lets you choose which of the installed policies, uh, uh, security profiles rather, um, to enable. Uh, so that allows you to sort of install the policies without running them and then activate them separately. And then uh, here we create a namespace. And uh, you know normally a namespace would be empty, but uh, with this uh, security profile, it automatically creates a network policy in the namespace. And so when we do get namespace over here, you can see that uh, uh, in, in this demo one namespace, it has a security profile. And actually, also role bindings were automatically added to the namespace when it got created. So, um, And then I think the last piece of the demo is just showing that 
There's also uh, a pod, secure, uh, pod security policy, which is a cluster level. Um, this is still doing the, the, the namespace level configuration, but then there's also the pod security policy was installed uh, as an example of a cluster level policy um, when, when the cluster was brought up. So the demo goes on a little longer, but that's kind of just enough to give you the gist of it. Uh, and that is the end of the discussion about, uh, the, the end of the discussion about um, the security profiles. And um, if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them after the talk. Uh, okay, well, yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, so there's uh, this um, is not necessarily 100% what uh, would be the final version. This was just sort of a prototype, but there's a mission controller that is um, responsible for uh, populating the namespace with the policy objects when it gets created. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that that is a question we've kind of debated. Um, there's pros and cons of that. So w we were trying to avoid having some kind of templating system built in here. And when you start getting into something like quota, um, the issue is that that's going to be very specific to a particular installation. Um, you know, everybody, everybody's organization is going to have different quotas. And so um, if we want to avoid having some way of doing like templates and, and parameter substitution, we kind of have to only stick to uh, policies that could be, you know, very generic and applicable to, I'll say, all uh, use cases of a particular type. So it's possible that we could extend this to handle something like resource quota um, that would be you know, specific to a particular uh, organization. But for now, we were trying to avoid that because that gets into kind of a big, a big uh, rat's nest of, of customization and how to do that. You can, of course, add your own resource quotas later after this is started up. No, so there is. I didn't show the enough of the. I didn't show an example of how you define the pod security policy because I was supposed to just be five minute talk. But um, there is a way to to specify uh, exceptions, and uh, we haven't really decided. Like right now, you can list uh, uh, which namespaces by name, and then also exceptions by name. We've also talked about just selecting the namespaces by label selector. Um, but yeah, definitely, um, for example, the cube system namespace, you probably may want different policies on than other namespaces, for example. And so yeah, so that's an important feature. OK, I don't want to uh, take up too much time for this. We have other folks who have presentations. And so the next one is, um, let's see. Right, Ray, yes. Ray is gonna talk about config as code, API design, and you. So you might wonder why I'm presenting this at a multi-tenancy working group talk. Um, and the reason is, is as, as we push forward on multi-tenancy, what we're gonna find is that uh, clusters are used by more and more people and they're become more multi-tenant by nature, and so, the variance that you get between different namespaces and different workloads is going to increase. And so what that results in um, is different policies and different configurations in, in each namespace. But also, because they're also becoming used in a bigger way, uh, they're going to be done in an annealing type way where config as code is generally the way that people do this. So you're gonna have a repo, the repo is gonna represent the configuration cluster state, and you're gonna wanna go ahead and push out uh, policies via this 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 config. So, how we do API design and what we kind of do with, especially with the admission control, really matters. So, we'll just give a quick overview of kind of the config as code uh, workflow, right? So, API objects are represented as files. Uh, the workflow generally is you edit a file, you uh, get it reviewed, you push it to your uh, CIDC staging repo, tests run on it, you wait for them to pass. 
um, that gets pushed to your source of truth repo. And then the CI CD system invokes the config management tool. And then the config management tool calls an API to reify the changes to the platform, right? And sometimes CI CD systems may repeat steps to allowing slow rollout and things like that. So that's generally the workflow. So things can go wrong in this workflow and where they generally go wrong and it's the worst case is at the last stage of the pipeline. So you made a change, you got it reviewed, you pushed it up there and it went all the way through and in that last step, which I bolded in the previous one, it fails. And so you end up with an error. The error is generally, you know, some sort of Kubernetes error wrapped in, let's say, a Terraform error wrapped in, you know, Jenkins. And so you're kind of looking at that and wondering what to do. And then you find out, oh, you know what, some admission controller fired. I didn't know that I was going to be restricted on this. And so therefore, I have to go back and change my thing. And then you got to repeat the whole process again, get another review and go through and hope. Right. So the other problem that happens is, is that that thing is changed. The, the, the change that you made is in the actual uh, source of truth repo. And if you're not diligent, it will stay there forever. And so now you have differing between your source of truth repo and what's in, in production. Okay. So causes of this is that your config management tools validation do not match the API validation. And so this is where the, you know, and then um, pipelines that aim to test and validate separate separate the user from the actual deployment and reduce the ability to react quickly. So what we want to do is get that validation to happen as early in the process as possible. And so if we can do that, then we don't have to go through these steps and we can, guarantee, we can have a better guarantee that once it makes it through the CICD pipeline, it will apply. So what is our general approach that we recommend when doing and thinking about API designs and especially around admission control and how we want to control and constrain our our APIs. So um, we want to make the API validation code portable, right? So not only does it run as an admission controller on the API server, but it also can run as a pre-commit hook in your Git system or whatever your source repo system is. And ideally, it's the same code. So when they rev, they rev together, right? Um, validation code needs to give very explicit errors about what went wrong and where to go to get documentation to understand what the constraints are. So you're not guessing. We want to reduce the guess. Because the, the um, make a change and apply cycle is so long on these config as code pipelines, you want to reduce that as, as much as possible. And then, you know, again, where we're at is CICD pipeline is there to ensure the commit. So what you, the reason why you have a CICD pipeline in this case is because you can do, you know, get pre-submit dash N and ignore pre-commit hooks. So you need something there that can actually run those and guarantee that they happen. That's what your CICD pipeline is doing. It's effectively verifying that you have done the appropriate uh, setup so that the error fails in the, in, the, um, in the pipeline rather than at commit time. So that's basically all I got. Um, just a super quick overview on what to think about. Ah, go ahead. So this is like apply moving to the server side. Um, yeah, so the, the question was, is uh, the API machinery is, consider, is, is working to move uh, cube apply into the server side rather than it currently being uh, client side? And how does this play with that? So um, unfortunately, uh, well, I mean, it, we, should, we should find out. So at the end of the day, what you want to be able to do is give someone the permission to be able to validate something <laughs> without the ability to actually run the command. So. The recommendation I would make is to, is to have a lower privilege command that says, hey, I can do like an apply dash dry run, right? It'll run that dry run, it'll run it against all the, the uh, validations and return it, and then I can put that in my, in my pre-commit hook, right? So that would be the recommendation to do there, and they could do that server side, but it would introduce a new set of roles, which are basically these lower privilege roles that let you do dry runs. So, good question. All right, anything else? Okay. Thanks, David. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Ray. And uh, so next, uh, I guess Lutz is going to talk about the uh, tenant operator. No, Christian is going to talk about tenant operator. Also fine, thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, hi, I'm Christian from uh, the University of Applied Sciences in Hamburg. And for the past one and a half years, uh, Lutz and me are running a, uh, a single cluster for about a thousand um, students that all use the same cluster as tenants. And from that, we brought the idea to create a tenant operator. 
because what we effectively faced here was the problem that how do we get all those uh, tenants configured into the cluster in a way that is meaningful. Like we want to create a namespace for them, we want to give them all the security profiles, which basically is a very good idea, I think, to ease up our lives. We want to provide PSPs for them, we want to enable certain projects to have access to certain privileged uh, stuff like GPUs, etc. So the motivation here really was to um, come up with a specialized implementation that would allow us to do so in a very um, common way. So what we have at the moment, it's uh, a bit down there, and the example is we have an integration with GitLab as our source of truth. So how that works is you create a project in GitLab and then we have a piece of code, basically just a service that then creates a namespace and the according rules in the cluster, which is a bit of a fast-paced solution that we just needed because we needed something to allow for all those students to have a secure way to access the cluster, to log into the cluster, um, and then have all the rights in place. So the idea here is that we want a shared implementation for that common functionality that we can use to monitor the resource used by the tenant because we need the quotas here, and of course enforce the limits for CPU, memory, net bandwidth, and probably also the number of declared objects because we have some students that really fire up a lot of pods and a, and a lot of containers, like 9,000 of them per 10 minutes or so, it's crazy. Um, so just to give you some numbers here, the, currently the cluster has 2,000 namespaces and about 12,000 role bindings. Um, so we, that's the numbers we run and 5,000 pods or 6,000 pods, um, exactly. So what we faced here was that we have now a tight integration between GitLab as our source of truth and the cluster. Um, so GitLab in our case is the organization specific implementation of where stuff comes from. Whereas uh, the common functionality here is that we provide access to namespaces and to allow people to do things. So we wanted to partition these concerns. And that's where we thought a, that a tenant operator would actually be quite nice. And at the multi-tenancy working group, we had the discussion about what should be the leaf, if you think about your organizational structure as a tree, what should be the leaf that reaches into the cluster and how far should we take the tree and let it drip into the cluster. And our approach or our suggestion is to just have a CRD that represents the tenant as being the leaf of this tree that is actually in the cluster and the rest remains into your organizational structure. So to, the idea was to finally be able to make an opinionated behavior that is explicit and configurable from your organizational structure into the cluster. So the intended mode of operation is quite simple. You have some kind of external system that is your source of truth. That might be your IDM system or your GitLab, GitHub, or whatever you use. And then we aim to implement, basically starting next week, a tenant operator and a tenant resource quota admission controller to enforce those resource limits. And with the addition of today, I think the security profiles would also be a nice fit here so that you could also say, I want to have these tenant objects, a specific profile applied to in their namespaces, for instance. So we came up with a definition of a tenant in our case, which says that a tenant consists of a set of namespaces in which any account with sufficient permissions may create Kubernetes objects. The number of these objects and their resource consumption are totaled over all namespaces of a tenant, because it's also a problem we have. We can uh, limit the amount of resources, a quota per namespace, but what we really want to do is we want to say that student or that working group has that amount of course and memory, etc., that they may use, and that should be totaled over all of their namespaces because we don't want to enforce them to use only a single namespace, and that's not possible currently as, as far as I'm aware. So that would essentially be the other thing that the um, tenant resource quota admission thing should actually do, that it totals all the namespaces and adds that to the quota and then per tenant says, okay, you cannot create any more parts because you use them all in your namespaces. So the idea in that, uh, um, in that tenant CRD would then be that for each of these metrics, a limit may be set per namespace or for the total of the, of the tenant. That depends a bit on how specific you want to go. So for now, what we did was we came up with a, um, a tenant CRD proposal that is also available here in the Google Docs, and we also link that to the mailing list. And that tenant should contain, of course, a unique name that is also unique across the whole system externally, so the name needs to be only one time there. 
and a list of namespaces that that should be valid for. And then, of course, I list all the things like course memory, API storage volumes, maybe. That could also include the type of storage that the tenant may use, but also, of course, the amount of storage it may use. Request per time unit, because we had some students that coded against the Kubernetes API and just hammered the API server and brought it down, or essentially at CD. So we also might want to restrict here on a per tenant base, which is also, I mean, you can restrict the API server, but not on a per tenant base, because I think the control plan is not really uh, a multi-tenancy aware at the moment. Yeah, and optionally, it may contain a map of username and roles to be able to map back and forth between those. In the future, what we would also like to have is a time to live for objects. So we can say, OK, you can burst for the weekend, for instance, to do your experiment or whatever, and then uh, the time to live is over, and we retract that um, possibility from your uh, tenant object again. So we have a little uh, proposal in here that is also uh, editable, I think, or at least uh, commentable, and we would really like to sh have your thoughts on that and see what else we can add to that and if you find it useful or not. And also around the discussion of is that um, tenant CRD thing really what we need or do we need further levels of abstraction in the cluster itself or not? We had some discussions with Ray on that on, <laughs> on the um, Zoom talks also. So yeah, I think that's it, yeah, so far. Is this one, sorry? Available, no, not yet, uh, because we have still to develop it. We first wanted to see what you think about that before we start, but essentially we aim to start on Monday to to provide some code. Yeah. Do you not have any multi-tenancy requirements like a network element? Network segregation? At the NIC level? We don't have those problems. Uh, I'm. Yeah, no, not at the moment. They can share the disks and, and the NICs and the memory and the, yeah, at the moment. Yeah. Um, I, I was just wondering because this is this might be something that you have already considered. This is a, a very nice abstraction that is simple and it lets you implement very quickly fairness in between tenants, which is very relevant in the case of a university. But the default of a simple abstraction is that people may want to map their more complex IDs, especially teams, into that. And then they might want to show on teams into the tenant concept. And suddenly teams don't necessarily have the same size, the same uh, requirements, and they are not equal to each other. And suddenly fairness becomes much more complicated. Um, how does that evolve in that kind of adversarial? OK. <coughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, that is an approach that we think the idea of having, um, it's actually not in here. We see this as a problem as well, because um, we of course have different size teams. That's basically research projects that have their uh, grant money turned into into computing power, and they have uh, different amounts of computing power here, of course. And um, so we think that we need a different tool for that. We, we dubbed that currently Tamias, which is, uh, uh, the name that we have for it, we have some outlines on that. We didn't yet develop it. It would be the system where you define who gets how much uh, resources on which um, and which guarantees to those resources are delivered. And you can also share resources or lease resources for a period of time. So we see these two systems separated. This is basically to enforce the stuff and to connect to uh, the Kubernetes thing here. And then the other thing would be to how do you I fill these resource quota limits to uh, to adjust that for different team sizes, requirements, et cetera. That's the idea. Okay, yeah, we should probably, uh, thank, thanks. Uh, let's give a round of applause. So. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure we could uh, squeeze in uh, Kevin, the uh, last speaker, before we run out of time. Uh, oops, not that. 
this is what, uh, yeah. I can. Uh, do you want to just? Yeah. Let me try to make it larger. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin from uh, Huawei Cloud. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, I, I don't got time to make elegant slides, so uh, just a document. Uh, we recently rolled out our uh, cloud container instance service, and uh, it's still under preview, but we'd like to uh, share our, some, uh, some of our experience and uh, some uh, issue we are facing too. Uh, so the first is the how we use that. Uh, current, currently, uh, the cloud container instance a little bit different uh, to others is that we also uh, expose Kubernetes API. So uh, basically here we just uh, roughly block all this um, root scope API because that's a uh, kind of issue under uh, multi-tenancy. So uh, it's still a limited preview and only available in China. So sadly, you cannot try easily. Uh, so uh, first of all, it's about the tenant concept. So currently, we don't uh, uh, expli uh, explicitly define a tenant. We just map it to namespace. So uh, each user or tenant have one namespace. And uh, for the name, uh, we just uh, uh, generate by the platform, actually, the CCI controller. And uh, uh, actually, the name, I think it's not very um, Big issue. Imagine you creating a character on a multiplayer on online game. You, you would all, always some uh, get some notification that oh, this name is taken by someone else, right? So API access currently are uh, all uh, like Kubelet. Uh, it's uh, it will directly talk to the Kubernetes API server, but for end user, uh, we. Uh, just uh, let them only able to talk to the API gateway so we can build uh, the pertinent uh, API call rate limiting. And also uh, RBAC are enforced at that, that level. That makes it easier to start because uh, currently we don't have a pertinent uh, rate limiting or per, per namespace rate limiting in Kubernetes API, API server. Okay, uh, for the note, Oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, so for the nodes, uh, currently because it's a, a shared multi-tenant cluster, so we also uh, uh, manage the nodes. Uh, end user don't have uh, any access to the machine, uh, and we use a circuit container as a runtime. So uh, we are facing some uh, uh, detailed issue because, uh, for example. Uh, uh, some of the metrics currently not uh, cannot be easily collected. And for the network, we do have a, a network API as an CRD, and we are currently it's a uh, per uh, one network per namespace. And uh, the underlying container network work we have uh, our own uh, implementation. It's an L two isolation uh, which is very uh, similar to a neutron. Uh, but uh, for the network creation, currently we don't block uh, part creation, but uh, it will uh, get ready finally. For storage, actually, uh, here is just uh, some uh, issue. Uh, uh, as we know that empty DIR by default, we can uh, indicate the limit, but it, but the behavior is that if if the part is uh, using too much uh, space uh, and ex ex exceeds the limit, uh, uh, Kubernetes will uh, evict uh, evict the part. Uh, we think that's uh, not uh, a good experience, so we introduced something alternative to empty DIR. So, uh, and underlying we use uh, LVM to manage the disk. So. Um, uh, it will prevent the pod using more than it claimed. So, but but the pod will not be evicted. Yeah. And another one open issue is that how to uh how to uh to to keep the uh, pod always up because uh for example uh, the um, why we introduce something alternative to empty DIR is also that because we have no control. Uh, what kind of uh, uh, workload will uh, will the end user run in the container? We don't want to uh, evict the 
container or reboot container. So, uh, but there are do some issues like, uh, what do we do if if the kubelet needs to be upgraded, or sometimes we need to uh, to do some uh, OS upgrade. The node may have to be shut down, but uh, so we we have not yet solved that yet. But uh, it's uh, we think that's a very important uh, issue. Another one is the root scope API access. Uh, uh, for example, CRD currently uh, we know that uh, like on the Kubernetes engine, because end user has the full access to the whole cluster as well as the Kubernetes API, so. Uh, they can easily create a CRD and install whatever operator they want, but on a on a, a multi-tenant Kubernetes cluster, it's uh, because CRD is a uh, root scope. So currently, our uh, solution is just uh, we install some of uh, actually we just register some of the CRD to to uh, available for end user, but for the operator they. Uh, Depends on the end user. If they wanted to use, they can uh, run operate, operator on in their namespace and use the CR. And another one is uh, the PV uh, PV API because end user uh, currently we uh, for compute resources actually we just uh, uh, charge by con uh, by container, so that's fine. That's kind of uh, resale from. Uh, Reselling the the computing resources, but the, the storage uh, end user could uh, directly could, uh, for example, create volume on Huawei Cloud. But it's it's kind of uh, weird that they, they have uh, they cannot manage um, persistent volume, though they can though, uh, they can create PVC, but that's not enough. So that's another open issue of the Ruscope API. Yeah, thanks. Let's give Kevin a round of applause. And if you have questions for him, please uh, come up and, and talk afterwards or any of the folks who talked. Thanks a lot. We hope you'll join us at the working group uh, bi-weekly meetings. Um, they're at uh, 11 AM on Wednesdays, I think, Pacific time. Um, but you can uh, look that up on the GitHub site. All right, thanks, everyone.